It is May 2003, somewhere in the United States, in a quiet, dimly lit room at the Securities and Exchange Commission. A group of officials are arguing over one particular document. It is a filing by Halliburton, an American multinational, the world's second largest oil services company. On paper, everything looks routine until they spot one line. A group of company employees has made $2.4 million in improper payments to Nigerian officials. That's right, Halliburton is confessing to bribery. $2.4 million paid to Nigeria's tax officials. The company claims it was just a few low-level employees going rogue, trying to secure favorable tax treatment between 2001 and 2002. But here's the catch. How do low-level employees divert millions of dollars without any of the higher-ups noticing? Little did the SEC know that this was just the tip of the iceberg. Just across the Atlantic in France, a separate investigation was about to blow open one of the most shocking bribery scandals the world had ever seen. One that involved major companies from the United States France, Italy, and Japan. A complex web of $180 million in bribes. And Nigerian officials, including ministers and heads of state, were at the center of it all. This is the story of how it all went down. Now let's pause here for a second. Imagine being able to create anything, from a cyberpunk story about robots escaping the matrix to an epic exploration of the world's most incredible wonders, all with just a few simple words. Now check this out. Make a one minute video of the story of a robot in a cyberpunk setting that wants to escape the matrix. There existed a robot named Nexus. And if you happen to love history like I do, you may want to make a YouTube video about the 10 most incredible wonders of India. You could have a 10 minute video in seconds with just a few text prompts. This is the incredible InVideo V3, the most powerful tool for turning your ideas into full length videos using only text prompts. If you want to change anything, just ask. If you want to add your own voice, you can do that as well. Whether you're creating storytelling, product videos, social media posts, or purely imaginative creations, InVideo V3 is your new go-to tool for bringing your wildest ideas to life faster and better than ever before. And this is not just some grand promises either. InVideo AI's new update does so much more than Sora and the likes and in just a few weeks it will be available for everyone. No waiting, no research fees, just results. Imagine your next art, explainer or epic story all crafted within minutes. This is endless possibilities, limitless creativity to bring your imagination to life. Don't miss out on this. InVideo V3 is dropping soon and if you use my exclusive code displayed on your screen right now, when signing up, you will get 2 times video creation minutes in the first month for their current version. Click the link in the bio and start bringing your imagination to life. Thank you InVideo for sponsoring this video. Let's jump back into our story. The year is 1989. Nigeria is sitting on one of the largest natural gas reserves in the world and its government is eager to tap into that wealth. A huge construction deal is on the table. The Bonny Island liquefied natural gas plant, a multi-billion dollar project that would turn Nigeria into a global gas exporting powerhouse. To get the ball rolling, Nigeria forms a joint venture. Some of the biggest names in the industry are in on it. Shell, Elf, Egypt and the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, that is the NNPC. They all came together to form what is now known as Nigerian LNG Limited or NLNG for short. With Shell as the technical advisor, it seems like everything is lining up pretty well. The only thing left is the massive contract to build the gas plant, a deal worth billions. About a year later in 1990, the NLNG board made an important decision. They wanted to select a single company to handle the entire project, engineering, construction, everything. 
The idea was one contract, one company to streamline the entire process. By May of 1992, two massive consortiums were in the running to build this billion dollar gas plant. The first group was BCSA, a consortium that included Bechtel, that is from the United States, Chioda from Japan, Spybat, a French firm, and Ansaldo from Italy. On the other side was TSKJ, a powerhouse consortium made up of Technip, a French engineering firm, Snamprogetti, an Italian gas and oil company, Japan Gas Corporation, and M.W. Kellogg, the American oil infrastructure company that would later be at the center of the scandal. By the time the bids were submitted in May 1992, BCSA's proposal was cheaper. They seemed like the obvious choice, right? Well, not so fast. Shell, that is the project's technical advisor, steps in. They are evaluating more than just the price. They are looking at the speed and quality. And after reviewing both proposals, Shell and the NLNG Technical Advisory Committee decide that while TSKJ's bid is more expensive, it's technically superior and promises faster completion. In October 1992, the NLNG board faces a tough decision. Stick with the cheaper BCSA, as Nigeria's petroleum minister recommends, or go with Shell's advice and choose the pricier TSKJ. They side with Shell. But this decision was not without its controversy. You see, by August 1993, Nigeria had slipped into a political turmoil as a result of the June 12 annulment. The country's leadership changed, and Chief Ernest Shonekon took over the Nigerian government. This led to a drastic change in the setup of the Nigeria LNG's equity holdings. The new president gave the green light for the venture to be reconfigured with the foreign shareholders Shell, Elf and Egypt taking a majority 51% of the company, giving them managerial control in the process. Meanwhile, NNPC's share was reduced to 49%. This shift, which gave more power to the foreign corporations, reopened the door for more bidding. So, the initial bid and award to TSKJ was abandoned. By September 1994, M.W. Kellogg and these three other companies which formed the TSKJ partnership had incorporated in Madeira, Portugal, with each partner owning a 25% equal share. The partnership submits another bid to build this gas plant in Bonny Island. This time, the bid is not immediately accepted, even though it is now 5% lower than that of BCSA. It is November 1994, and TSKJ is now becoming restless. Not wanting to miss out on this lucrative contract, they start to get creative. Remember, TSKJ is this partnership that includes M.W. Kellogg from the United States, Technip of France, Italy's Snap Progetti, and Japan Gasoline Co. So, what did they do? Well, first, a Kellogg executive who would later become a consultant for Kellogg, Brown and Root meets with a London lawyer named Jeffrey Tesla. More on this Tesla guy later. During this meeting, they discussed funneling 40 million US dollars to General Sani Abacha through a company called TriStar based in Gibraltar, Spain. This company is owned by Mr. Tesla. By March of 1995, TSKJ was still waiting for Nigeria LNG to accept its bid. To fast track the process, the Kellogg executive formally hired Mr. Tesla as an agent on behalf of TSKJ. According to the employment contract, Mr. Tesla would be paid 16 million US dollars if Nigeria awarded the construction contract to TSKJ. His company, TriStar, was also contracted to receive at least $160 million in five agreements signed between 1995 and 2002. With the agreements signed, the funds were disbursed to bank accounts held in Switzerland and Monaco. From here, things cannot start to move really fast. First, Dan Etet replaces Nigeria's former oil minister who just happened to have a falling out with General Sani Abacha. And it just so happened that the new guy has some sort of relationship with Mr. Tesla. A relationship that will be exploited much later. By June 1995, another character was introduced into the scene. 
Mr. Albert Jack Stanley, was promoted to President and Chief Operating Officer of M.W. Kellogg. The company also hired Dick Cheney, who would later become the Vice President of the United States, to serve as a CEO. A few months later, TSKJ is finally awarded a $2 billion contract from the Nigerian LNG. In February 1998, Halliburton and M.W. Kellogg's parent company, Dreza Industries, agreed to a $7.7 .7 billion merger directed by Dick Cheney. M.W. Kellogg was merged with Halliburton's Brown & Root subsidiary to form Kellogg Brown & Root. Then, Albert Jack Stanley, who was President and Chief Operating Officer of M.W. Kellogg, was named Chairman of the new subsidiary. A few months later, in 1999, the TSKG partners with Kellogg, Brown and Roots acting as the lead partner agreed to reappoint Mr. Tesla as its agent during a meeting held in London. By March 1999, Halliburton announced that the Nigerian government had awarded TSKJ a $1.2 billion contract to expand the construction of the natural gas plant from two trains to three trains, increasing the plant's capacity by 50%. At the same time, Stanley declared that the contract award exemplified Kellogg's project execution skills. By the time the first shipment of liquefied natural gas left Nigeria in October 1991, the country was already a democracy. And now, with some familiar faces out of government and inquiries being conducted into the dealings of some of the companies in this partnership, stories began to get out. In October 2002, French police were tipped off about a fishy business involving Nigerian officials. This was a spin-off of another investigation by French authorities into the alleged corrupt activities of the French oil company ELF. The allegations emerged after a certain Mr. Georges Kramer, a former director of Technip, that is a French company and a member of the TSKG consortium became a state witness in the ELF corruption probe. Kramer had alleged that Technip and the three other members of the TSKJ consortium had set up a $180 million fund to make corrupt payments to persons and firms linked to the NLNG project. The Paris prosecutor then launched a preliminary inquiry into Kramer's allegations. From these investigations, facts began to emerge on how the TSKG consortium incorporated a subsidiary company called LNG Services in Madeira, Portugal. Through this company, illegal payments were allegedly made to Trista in Gibraltar and to other persons linked to this LNG project. Jeffrey Tesla, the British lawyer and Gabriel Fatry, who runs GK Commerce and Finance in Geneva, appeared to be Trista's beneficial owners. About $150 million was traced to TriStar accounts at UBP Geneva and HSBC Monaco, among others. The big question then was, what project did TriStar execute for TSKJ to receive $150 million in payments? About eight months after the French police started working on this case, the prosecutor had gathered enough evidence to assign it to an anti-corruption judge. This was when Renard van Rombeke, a French investigative magistrate well known for specializing in political and financial corruption cases, was brought in. I went through a couple of documents that were used to prosecute this case and what I found was quite interesting. This whole investigation started with a letter dated March 17, 2003 from William Chowdan one of the directors of the LNG project, explaining Jeffrey Tesla's professional and personal relationship with Nigerian officials and the TSKJ consortium. In fact, one report stated that Dan Etet, the former oil minister to Nigeria's late dictator, Sani Abacha, revealed that Shell and KBR were well established in Nigeria and had close ties with the ruling class. The payments to this ruling class were not in dispute. What the investigators wanted to know was whether or not there were bribes or illegal commissions. 
Halliburton admitted that TSKJ paid $132 million in quote advisory fees to Mr. Tesla and that under Tesla's contract with the company, the money was not to be used for bribery. However, the French investigators said the payments to Mr. Tesla appeared completely unjustified. Other findings from the investigations revealed that the police judiciaire of France found that LNG Savicos, a company indirectly owned by the four partners in the Nigerian joint venture, made four payments totaling at least $160 million at times that roughly coincide with the award of the contracts. The payments went to a Gibraltar company owned by Mr. Tesla, our London attorney, to a Swiss bank account that was later closed at the request of the bank. Also, in an interrogation of Mr. Tesla, a French magistrate described the London lawyer's transfer of $2.5 million into Swiss bank accounts held by Mr. Etet under a false name between 1996 and 1998. Mr. Tesla confirmed making the payments but told the magistrate that the money was for an investment in offshore oil exploration leases in Nigeria and that he wasn't aware the accounts belonged to Mr. Etet. As pressure from the investigations continues to mount, Halliburton fired Albert Jack Stanley after investigators say he received $5 million in improper payments from Mr. Tesla. The company also fired William Chowdhury, the Kellogg representative at TSKJ. By August 2004, the Nigerian parliament voted unanimously to begin an investigation into Halliburton's activities. However, the investigations hit a brick wall as soon as they started. The company refused to cooperate with Nigerian investigators. Even as Halliburton continued to deny all wrongdoing, the Wall Street Journal report in September of 2004 showcased new evidence, including notes written by M.W. Kellogg employees during the mid-1990s where they discussed bribing Nigerian officials. The Nigerian president, Olusegun Nobasanjo, decided in September 2004 to officially ban Halliburton from bidding on future government contracts because it violated safety regulations for nuclear materials. But this ban had nothing to do with the bribery scandal. The president was instead accusing Halliburton of negligently causing the disappearance of two highly sensitive radioactive devices used to take measurements in oil wells. Even with all this scandal, Halliburton didn't back down. As investigators tried to put the pieces together, a former Halliburton employee came out in September 2006 claiming he had evidence to show that the company was actively engaged in a campaign to cover up all wrongdoing, including attempts to mislead investigators. But who helped Halliburton and his subsidiary carry out these illegal payments? Although several names have come up in the course of the investigation, the principal characters appear to be Gilbert Chagori, the Lebanese businessman friend of the late head of state, General Sani Abacha. We also have former oil minister, Chief Dan Etet, and Abacha himself, as well as our London lawyer, Jeffrey Tesla. There is no day when I do not regret my weakness of character. I allowed myself to accept standards of behavior in a business culture which can never be justified. I accepted the system of corruption that existed in Nigeria. I turned a blind eye to what was happening and am guilty of the offenses charged. That was Jeffrey Tesla speaking at the end of his 2012 sentencing hearing after pleading guilty to US corruption charges for his role in what became known as the Halliburton bribery scandal. According to files obtained by the French newspaper Le Monde and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ, Tesla has ties to high-ranking Nigerians implicated in the bribery scandal. But who is this Jeffrey Tesla guy? Well, in 1994, when the Nigerian government launched ambitious plans to build this Pony Island natural liquefied gas project, Tesla was just a simple lawyer from North London. He started his career advising UK-based Nigerians on property deals. He would later grow into a superstar lawyer, building and maintaining relationships with successive Nigerian military and civilian governments. According to reports, 
Tesla began planning the bribe payments in 1994 and transferred small amounts of money to Switzerland in July 1996. However, by 2003, his role had escalated. In fact, in one bold and bizarre episode, Tesla reportedly directed the drop off of a travel bag stuffed with $1 million in a luxury hotel in the Nigerian capital of Abuja. This was one of at least 20 money transfers made by Tesla. According to the House of Representatives in 2004, Halliburton, through Tesla, paid bribes on behalf of TSKJ to Nigerian government officials in installments. $60 million for the first contract on 20th of March 1995, $37.5 million for the second contract on the 18th of March 1999, and then $51 million for the third contract on the 24th of December 2001. He also paid $23 million for the fourth contract on the 28th of June 2002. The bribe distributor, Mr. Tesla, was also described as the personal legal advisor of many people including businessmen, politicians and military officers in Nigeria while operating as consultant to many firms operating within Nigeria. According to French police investigations, Mr. Tesla had a lot of information about the dirty deals in the Nigerian oil and gas sector. Tesla also had his hands in other lucrative oil deals. He was the same man who fronted for Etet to buy the juicy oil block 256 for a mere $8 million from Sherwood Petroleum in 1999. That was during the Abu Bakr Abdul Salami era. However, when President Olusegun Nobasanjo took over three months later and discovered that there were lots of fraudulent activities during the military regime, he seized the oil block and sold it to Ocean Energy for $240 million. A decision that did not go down well with the former petroleum minister Dan Etet. Tesla confirmed to the court that he ensured that accounts opened in the name of Dan Etet were credited with the following payments from the TriStar UBP account. Between July 1996 and February 1997, $482,795 was wired into Credit Suisse account with account number 230095 in the name of Omoni Amafega with the code D319. In the same vein, $500,000 was transferred to this same person under the code name PAPA D320 on 10th of February 1998 in Bank Hoffman with account number 12423. He also disclosed to the court that MD Yusuf facilitated a meeting between him and the late General Sani Abacha to whom he made two payments of $75,000 in 1998. French investigators implicated many other top Nigerian officials, some working with the NNPC and its subsidiaries, who were on different occasions beneficiaries of sums of money ranging between $50,000 to millions of dollars, depending on the status and relevance to the LNG project. The files obtained by Le Monde and ICIJ show that nine people, including members of the Tesla family and Nigerian nationals, held a variety of roles with accounts at HSBC Private Bank Suisse between 1990 and 2003. This was months before the completion of the gas plant. Nine of the 12 accounts instructed HSBC to keep all correspondence under lock and key in a bank safe. Tesla's wife, Judy, is named in the files as a beneficial owner and a controlling client of two accounts one of which was opened in 1999 and at one point in 2006 or 2007 held $35.3 million. The files do not specify her role in relation to a third account. As he did with his wife, Tesla also transferred bribe money into accounts in the names of his daughters. According to the leaked files, one daughter, Laura, then in her 20s, became a millionaire, at least on paper through her beneficial ownership of an account under the name of a Panamanian company that held almost $4 million. Well, Judy Tesla and her daughters were not charged with any crimes. The leaked files also revealed that Tesla had financial ties to two former Nigerian officials, now retired Major General Chris Garuba, 
chief of staff to former Nigerian president Abdul Salami Abubakar, who himself allegedly received bribes as president. And another person is Andrew Agom, a senior government official who was killed in an attack on a motorcade. Agom was the beneficial owner of an HSBC account linked to a Gibraltar-based company, Hemisphere Services Limited, which held a maximum amount of $797,377 at one point in 2006-2007. Agom's account was opened in 1991, on the same day that another account was opened in the name of a former Nigerian Air Force Chief, Abdullahi Dominic Bello. A spokesperson for Bello denied the allegations of bribery. He told ICIJ that the account which was used for business purposes and opened by Tesla when he was Bello's lawyer had never been used for slush funds or bribes. The HSBC files identified Chris Garuba and his wife Rita as HSBC clients. Their names are listed along with Tesla's in an account named Bridlington Enterprises Limited, for which Tesla acted as an attorney. The files show that the account was opened the year before Tesla sent his first bribe payment to Switzerland, although the files do not show that Tesla transferred money into the Bridlington account, which held as much as $367,547 in 2006 2007. So, with everyone denying ever collecting any bribe payments, the question remains, who actually took the bribe? Because the bribe distributor Mr. Tesla admitted to paying the bribes, so who took them? As for Tesla, the bribe distributor, he was sentenced to 21 months in prison and forfeited $149 million from his Swiss accounts to the US government for serving as the go-between for bribes paid to secure contracts in Nigeria. Another important character in this story is Albert Jack Stanley. Before pleading guilty to bribery in the federal courtroom in Texas, Albert Jack Stanley was a loyal servant of Halliburton. Stanley began his rise up the corporate ladder with M.W. Kellogg, an oil infrastructure company then owned by Dresser Industries. The court documents said he hatched the plan to hire consultants who could direct the bribe payments to Nigerian officials. One consultant from England would pay off higher level Nigerian officials, while a second consultant from Japan would be responsible for bribing lower ranking officials. Accordingly, two representatives were hired, a consulting company TriStar based in Gibraltar and a trading company based in Tokyo. TriStar was paid $132 million while the Tokyo company got $50 million. According to documents by the US Justice Department, all the money was to be passed to Nigerian officials. The court documents said that in November 1994, the unidentified UK consultant allegedly told an associate that it would take $60 million to secure the contract. Of that money, $40 million to $45 million will go to Nigerian officials' first top-level executive branch, while another $15 million to $20 million would go to other Nigerian officials. Later that month, according to court documents, Stanley himself traveled to the Nigerian capital to meet with senior officials and confirm that the UK consultant would serve as a go-between. TSKJ operating through subsidiary companies in the Portuguese offshore tax haven of Madeira Island signed agreements to transfer millions of dollars to the UK consultant. In December 1995, the Nigerian government awarded TSKJ the first gas plant contract. Over the next decade, the government awarded TSKJ four contracts worth a total of $6 billion to build and expand the plant. Throughout that time, Stanley continued traveling to Nigeria to meet with senior officials and continued arranging payments through the UK and Japanese consultant firms. Overall, Stanley traveled to Nigeria to meet with top officials on four occasions between 1994 and 2001 as part of the bribery scheme. TSKJ paid $130 million in bribes through the UK consultant and $50 million through the Japanese firm. 
as pressure from the allegations of corruption mounted, Hal Burton conducted his own internal investigations into the charges and by June 2004, the company publicly fired Stanley. We also have Giba Chaogori, another Abacha associate named in this scandal. If there's one name that stands out when it comes to General Sani Abacha and his shadowy dealings, it is Giba Chaogori. To some, he was simply known as the gatekeeper of the Abacha regime. But Chaguri wasn't just the man behind the scenes. His connections ran very deep. In fact, he had direct lines to power. With close contacts in Washington, Chaguri was not only taxed with laundering money for the late dictator, but he also helped to launder his image with folks like Bill Clinton and the like. Yeah. That's the story for another day. Chagri himself claims that his relationship with Abacha began by chance on a flight to Port Harcourt. Abacha at the time was just a young officer, but the two hit it off and that flight marked the beginning of a friendship that would last for decades. So when Abacha seized power in a military coup in 1993, Chagri was right by his side, becoming the dictator's most trusted advisor. Within just months of Abacha taking power, money started disappearing from Nigeria's central bank, huge amounts of it. Subsequent governments would later reveal that Abacha fraudulently siphoned off money in the name of national security. But in reality, those funds were quietly transferred to overseas accounts belonging to Abacha's family and close business associates, including Chagori. By the time Abacha died in 1998, his so-called security payments had raked up over two billion dollars. I made a deep dive on that topic in a video I will link right up here. Do have to check it out if you haven't seen it. But money laundry wasn't the only game Abacha was playing. According to the US Justice Department, in the early 90s, Abacha had struck a deal to accept a 40 million dollar bribe which was just the first installment of a much larger payoff. That money was meant to grease the wheels, not just for Abacha, but for officials of the regimes that followed him. Chowgri, of course, denies any involvement in the bribery scheme, but his name did come up in some interesting places. Jeffrey Tesla kept meticulous records of these so-called cultural meetings where bribes were on the table. And in one entry, it reads $250 to Ipco via Chowgri. Now, when asked about this little note, Chagri didn't deny that the figure was actually $250 million. However, he claimed that this wasn't a bribe at all. He insisted that it was for a legitimate contract awarded to his company, Ipco Nigeria Limited, related to a natural gas project. Despite the connections, Chagri was never charged by the Justice Department in the bribery case. But how about the banks? There were some pretty interesting transactions involved here. Citibank was identified as one of the banks through which bribes were funneled. Accounts at Citibank were used to transfer millions of dollars to various shell companies and offshore accounts to disguise the illicit payments. Funds were routed through Citibank branches in Switzerland and other locations to ensure that the transactions would not attract immediate scrutiny. And then there is JP Morgan Chase. Similar to Citibank, JP Morgan Chase was also used to move bribe payments. Accounts in the United States and abroad were utilized to transfer money to various intermediaries and officials. The bank processed transactions that were part of the elaborate scheme designed to keep the bribes hidden from regulators and authorities. There is also BNP Paribas. The French bank BNP Paribas was implicated as one of the financial institutions used by the consortium to channel funds to Nigerian officials. These transactions were often routed through offshore jurisdictions to avoid any form of detection. This was a well-orchestrated scheme and the players had help from some of the biggest banks in the world. After five years of investigations, the US Justice Department announced on February 11, 2009 that Kellogg Brown and Root KBR, 
formerly a subsidiary of the Halliburton Corporation, pleaded guilty to violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and agreed to pay a total of $579 million in fines for their part in the decade-long scheme to bribe government officials in Nigeria in exchange for construction contracts. The fine is the largest ever for a U.S. company under the Foreign Crop Practices Act, which forbids the bribing of foreign government officials to obtain or retain businesses overseas. As for the consortium, between 2009 and 2011, the consortium members paid penalties totaling more than $1.5 billion for their role in the bribery scheme. Two KBR officials who had worked with Tesla, that is Wojcik Chodan and Albert Jack Stanley, KBR's former chairman and CEO, were also sentenced to one year of probation and 30 months in prison respectively. But the big elephant in the room, Dick Cheney, the former US vice president who happened to be the chief executive of Halliburton, the parent company of KBR, for five years from 1995 to 2002 before becoming US vice president in 2001, claimed he was innocent and had nothing to do with the entire scheme. Well, I guess we would never know. <laughs>